Morning friends, Karen Pennington here, and I did something very, very brave this weekend, at least in my mind it is. I took a hungry, tired toddler into a grocery store to go shopping with me. Now, this wasn't just the regular kind of hungry and tired. Any of you have ever seen a toddler, you can probably relate to this, any fathers, mothers, grandparents there. Um, you know, Sometimes when a toddler gets a little bit tired, they're kind of pooped from play and they might ask for a bottle or you give them a bottle and they fall asleep naturally in your arms because they know they're hungry and they know they're tired and it's snuggling and that's usually what I have. Well, in this case, this said toddler was so hungry that she wouldn't eat anything. She was so tired that she was upset that she was tired and she was so busy being upset that she was tired that she wouldn't go to sleep. And meanwhile, I had to get grocery shopping, so I had to take her in with me. And then, when she wanted everything she saw, I had to say no. And of course, this is my granddaughter. How do you say no to your granddaughter? These are all the things that grandparents should not have to do. Because grandkids are supposed to be all of the love, all of the snuggles, all of the cuteness, all of the adoration, a fraction of the diapers, twice the sleep, and none of the discipline. That's the parent's job. Well, in this case, <laughs> we had her for 24 hours because we offered to our daughter and son-in-law once a week to take her for a day. And really, when we were offering, we were requesting because we want her, <laughs> because we love her. And because she's so beautiful and joyful, and she still is, but now that she's walking and she's a little older and she's starting to develop a beautiful personality. She's also sometimes a little bit more difficult, a little bit more of a challenge. And the hard thing is, you know, as a grandparent, you don't, as a parent, you don't want to make your kids sad. And as a grandparent, you definitely don't want to make your, your grandkids sad because you're supposed to be the fun one who spoils them and does fun things with them. And I was like that as the auntie. I wanted to be the cool one and the fun one who brought cool gifts. And I still want to be that. <laughs> I have my oldest nephew is almost 30 years old. I still want to be the fun auntie who gives him the cool stuff and the candy and the fun soda and all that. So this was a little hard because in the grocery store I had to say no. And I took a sad girl and I had to make her sadder. And I did not like that. And then there were even tears. And she wanted her binky and we're trying to wean her off the binky. And so I had to say no. And then a little bit later in the day, she said no to me and I had to correct her. I had to say, don't talk to Cammy like that. And um, you know what? It, it kind of worked. There was some touch and go, but I, I said, you don't say no to Cammy. And she said, okay and I said what do you say sorry and she said sorry and then I got to comfort her and then I remembered okay this is right <laughs> you see I know sometimes saying the hard things to people it's particularly those cute little ones that you just want to smile from to people we love sometimes it's hard to say those hard things I don't know if it gets easier when they're older actually I think it gets harder um, as our children get older, because we know there could be an eruption, you know, and it gets super, super hard when it's people that we're not really taken care of, our friends, and have you ever had to say something really difficult to a friend? Have you ever had to deliver really bad news? I mean, my heart goes out to the doctors who have to, you know, tell them about a test result that isn't great and figure out how to do it, um, with care and concern, but without too much drama, because you don't want a doctor to say, it's not good. You know, that's a little wimpy there, but you also don't want somebody to talk to you as if nothing happened. Like I broke my shoelace, you know, and it's hard. And we don't want to say things that are difficult. We don't want to tell people. And sometimes God calls us to say something to a friend or a member of our congregation and it, they're doing something that's hurtful to themselves or others, and we know it'll hurt them to know that, you know, what you're doing is not good. Um, my husband had to have a conversation like that, and it wasn't even a member of our congregation. It was somebody who we were trying to make feel welcome, but they were doing something that was incredibly, incredibly inappropriate. 
and they kept pressing into it and we had to say you you can't do this this is this is not helpful and that person was angry and walked off and complained about how unloving the church was and we I was sure we were sure that we handled it properly and we had been in conversation with the pastor and the pastor was ready to say this and it um it was it was hard um and then there are times that people tell me you know particularly when my daughter was younger you've been a little too harsh with her you know I think you got your priorities out of line right now or maybe you need to apologize to your husband (laughs) it's not easy to hear either it really isn't and the worst is probably with the baby because I just want to love on her but it it's not easy to have difficult conversations Um, probably one of one of the many signs that you're supposed to have it is because you know you're supposed to, but it doesn't feel right. If you're ready to run in and tell somebody, oh, let me put you in your place. Let me tell you what you've done wrong. Let me just show how I'm better than you. Let my self-righteousness shine in glory. That You're probably not in the right place, but um, there's a case. I was thinking about this. Um, as I'm reading through, you know, kind of living in the current books of the Corinthians, and I was reading through Second Corinthians, uh, and Paul was talking about how proud he was of the Corinthian church and how they had grown and how generous they were and how they were willing to make changes and grow up. Now, this was a very different tone than First Corinthians. First Corinthians really was a chapter where he's going, you know, this was a pretty fairly affluent church. He, he, he touches on this a little earlier in this passage as well. They have pretty good money. They have pretty good status. They're in the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Um, they have relative comfort and ease and um, they're just kind of immature. He's kind of like basically you think you're all that in a bag of chips and you're not. You think you're smart. You're not as smart as you think you are. You think you don't need me check it again. Let me give you an attitude check. That's kind of his first one. And I really think you're out of line in a lot of ways and I need to tell you about this. Now, some people may read this and go, oh my goodness, who is he to stand on his high horse? But he gives some, um, he talks about it in 2 Corinthians. He really didn't enjoy doing that. As a spiritual father, he did not enjoy telling people when they were out of line or out of place. And he said this, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Now, originally he did. He said, now this is 2 Corinthians 7, uh, starting with verse 8, and he's talking about 1 Corinthians' letter. Um, Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow... 2 Corinthians 7.10 Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you've proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of the injured party, but rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, you were encouraged. See, that's what I call a godly reprimand. I'm not writing you to tell you you're wrong. I'm not writing you to tell you, you know, I'm not reveling in the fact that I'm pointing out something horrible that somebody's done. I was sad. I almost felt bad that I felt, first I felt bad that I did it. Because I don't want to make you feel bad. But now I'm so encouraged because you took it to heart. I wonder if that's what he meant by godly sorrow. I I wrote this in on one of my social media accounts, and one person wrote back about depression and good depression and bad, you know, and and I don't really think this is about depression so much. Although I guess it could be. Um, this is about mourning over our sin. You know, why, why are we sad? How are we sad? I think this is about the difference between conviction and guilt. If it's pulling us down, if it's drawing us back into the same sin we say we're regretting, 
That's not godly sorrow. That's guilt. If it causes us to feel like, oh, woe is me, how awful I am, my life is lost. And by the way, look at how horrible I am, I couldn't possibly change. That's guilt. But godly sorrow leads to repentance. That means change. That doesn't mean self-loathing. Self-loathing is not change. And I am so glad he wrote this because, you know, I still sometimes struggle as much as I like to talk now. There was a case, I have to say, a couple weeks ago where I would not have felt bad about putting someone in their place, which why my husband in his wisdom said, Karen, why don't you let me deal with this? You're a little angry. <laughs> and then I had to repent of my own attitude at that point. But, you know, when we really love somebody and we want to keep that relationship with them, when we know hearing this is going to make them sad, we don't want to be the one that causes tears, you know? And unfortunately, as parents in this society, we've overall, we've denigrated because we don't want that. We don't want our child to suffer a loss as a consequence. So we withhold consequences from them. We withhold godly, smaller consequences. And then they grow up not feeling consequences. And then when they're older... They don't know how to function as adults because they don't know how to take responsibility because they haven't suffered loss, even on the lower levels, because of things they've done. They may have suffered loss because of what someone else has done. They may have lived a horrible life because of abandonment or abuse or things, and I don't want to downplay that, but they haven't learned that godly discipline. You know, I'm grateful that there are people in my life who are willing to make me feel bad for a second for a minute and maybe even angry they're willing to make me angry they're willing to take on me being angry at them because they're telling me something that's healthy we put it uh, I used to teach a Sunday school class a way back and we had a whole conversation a few different times in different places I was at where we said we said this if somebody you knew did not know what soap was and because of that, they had open sores and they were bleeding and they, they weren't just unhygienal, but they were hurting and they really needed to be cleansed. And it got to the point where, you know, this, and not only that, but people wouldn't hang around them and you cared about this person. Would you care enough to tell them, let me introduce you to soap. Would you, would you care enough to do this thing that would offend them and hurt their feelings and maybe even want them not to be around you because they don't want you to tell them. Would you care enough to do that, even if it hurt them a little bit, if it meant introducing them to the thing that healed them and helped them? Would you care enough to do, as Proverbs said, give those wounds that can be trusted so that, pour that peroxide on the wound that stings so that the infection can go away? And let's look on the other hand. This is the harder part for me. I have to say, I don't love difficult conversations, but I really don't like it when I'm the recipient of it. And I still am sometime. And I pray and hope that I never, ever lose at least a little bit of an ability to be receptive when people tell me I'm being a jerk, basically. Do you have enough humility before God and before your friends that when somebody corrects you, no matter who it is, that you're willing to think about it and you're willing to own it and you're willing to say, are you willing to have a godly sorrow that replaces a self-righteous anger? Am I willing still when I get so, like the other day when I got so angry and critical of that one person, was I willing to hear, um, Check yourself, you know. Was I willing to have my own added? I want to be a second Corinthian, you know. I want to be that person that has the godly sorrow. I want to be the person that has the godly conviction. And the moment I say, I'm good, I, I just don't need it anymore. I've arrived. Then I've become just like the Corinthians were. I, I haven't matured. I've lapsed. But Jesus, thank you so much 
Thank you so much for the lightness that your print conviction brings where when we're, we become aware of the areas that we need to turn, there can be a hope that, okay, now we know what it is. We can fix it. Now I know what that was in my spirit that was weighing me down, Lord Jesus. Thank you for friends who care enough to confront in loving ways, not to tell us how wrong we are, as, as just like Paul said, not to tell us how wrong we are or to point out how they're better than us, but just to say, this thing is hurting you. This attitude, this action. Give us the humility to receive that, the grace to love and thank them. And Lord Jesus, guide our own hearts. May we have enough faith in you and may we lean into you that when you call us to have those difficult conversations, we can have them with candor and with grace. And thank you, God, because in you there is always, always, a chance at redemption, a chance to change, a chance to move forward, God. And we thank you just as the Corinthian church was a wonderful example of how you can grow in people and how love and being willing to fight those difficult fights can change. God, you're still there. You're still in us. And the whole church changed, God. There's no one you can't change. Just just put that in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Guide us, Lord Jesus. We need you every day, every minute to know the difference between the two. We love you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Be blessed and be guided well today, my friends.